when you feel that there's no shadow, that's what really freaks me out with of people. <laughs> when people think they have it figured out and, and it's too clear, those people really freak me out. <laughs> I'm thinking of like a creature that doesn't have a shadow. It's like a vampire or something. It's like a vampire, right? And what are vampires? They're the, they're the living dead. And what do yeah. they do? They suck the life out of other people. Now that you have learned what you have learned, it would be well for you to return to your own country. I prefer to remain and protect those whom you would destroy. You are too late. My blood now flows through her veins. She will live through the centuries to come as I have lived. Should you escape us, Dracula, we know how to save Miss Nina's soul, if not her life. If she dies by day, but I shall see that she dies by night. I will find your earth box and drive that stake through your heart. Come here. Come here. Your will is strong. I'm John Totten, and this is Between Us. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Monday, I start my, I have a break, finally. You know, the quarantine has been very intense. I mean, for everybody, I also took a lot of patience during that time and listening to and volunteering and listening to all the that was going on in people's lives that like, really took a toll on me and I, I I was like I got really overwhelmed so I need to I need the break in order to be able to continue working. <laughs> in the last four years, it has been impossible to not have politics on our minds. If you are a therapist you probably have found yourself hearing about the news and politics far more often in your sessions than you did five years ago. How do we engage in this? It's difficult to know, even if we agree with our patients' politics. What is therapeutic, or what can be therapeutic, about these discussions? Do they even belong in therapy? Are the problems of psychotherapy simply in the mind of the patient? Or are they bigger and more oppressive than even that? Or is there a difference between that which oppresses us internally and that which oppresses us from the outside? Our guest today has thoughts on all of these questions. Carlos Padron is a fascinating human. He was born and raised in Venezuela, where he studied philosophy before coming to New York, where he earned degrees in philosophy and Latin American literature, before starting his training as a psychoanalyst. So his background is in philosophy and literature as opposed to mental health, and he brings a unique perspective to this work. I learned about him in the documentary Psychoanalysis in El Barrio a film on working psychoanalytically with underprivileged Latinx patients in the U.S. In the corresponding book, Psychoanalysis in the Barrios, Carlos contributes the chapter entitled The Political Potentiality of the Psychoanalytic Process. He teaches at the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, and he was nice enough to talk to us from his home in New York. I'm conscious of, you know, for many of us across the country, what was happening in New York was, you know, simply images on the the news. And it's hard to imagine what it must have been like. And I know that it's still going on, but to be there, to be an essential worker at the time. It was unbelievable. Well, nobody has gone through a pandemic like this before. I mean, that's alive. And furthermore, nobody has been on a, on a world pandemic where, you know, you can actually see it developing in real time, social media and all that. It was kind of like, what would be the word, like post-apocalyptic in many ways, you know, to see the, the city completely barren and all the people dying, the, the trucks they had to bring because the morgues were too, you know, were overwhelmed by dead bodies, just what you saw, but then as an essential worker, 
listening to people from people who had family or loved ones or, or friends that died to, uh, you know, annihilation anxiety, the extreme fear of, of getting sick, vulnerability, helplessness, death. So it opened up all this Pandora box of deep seated anxieties that we kind of like patch over mm -hmm. by having our ordinary routines and our ordinary life. And that was very intense to see and to, to share that with the patient or the analysis, the client, however people call them. It's a shared trauma, right? So you're also going through it. it gives you a particularly, a particular understanding of, of what the person might be going through, but also doesn't allow you to have some distance from it because you're in it together with the person. Yeah. It, it breaks down any sense of like hierarchy that one or the other might carry to the relationship. You know, I think a lot of times our patients come to us thinking that we have some kind of peace or knowledge that they don't have. You're right. And that's out the window in the middle of a pandemic. I was invited to present on, on loss during the pandemic, and I spoke about things that we've lost. Besides the thing that I mentioned before, which is this sense of basic safety or illusion that we need of some kind of control over our lives and the reality that we need in order to be able to live. There was, as you said, for, for practitioners, clinicians, the loss of this clear, more clear cut roles and boundaries. And for many, especially more uh, classical or old school, I would say analysts, which is my orientation analysis, it, it kind of like broke that hierarchy that many of them want to sustain. That's on the side of the therapist, on the side of the patient too. They come again with this idea that, as you well said, you're the one who, who knows, who has some secret knowledge, who keeps, you know, their cool, uh, all that, who has their life figured out, you know, a, a fantasy, of course. But also on the side of the analyst was interesting to see how some were very disturbed or puzzled. I was in different meetings and groups with different analysts. You know, they will become a little more kind of like conversational with their patients. All of a sudden, your dog, I have two dogs, right? And your dog appeared in the scene and then the patient would have, oh, so you have a dog. Oh, yeah. But all of a sudden, you became very, very human or to the patient right. in a way that was very comforting for many patients to see your humanity. And to other people, it was, frankly, it could be disturbing or very anxiety producing because many patients that come to us need the illusion that, you know, that it's very safe, but more like a disembodied function of containment for everything they need. Mm -hmm. So it, it could produce a lot of anxiety in the other person. Well, I'm not, I'm not a classical analyst that way. I very much think that analysis is not, as I've said many times, it's not a mirror of the world, it's a part of the world. So, you know, we're in it with the patient, we're observers, but we're participants as well. But even if I thought that, it's a humbling experience to feel how deeply you are in the process and how you can't extricate yourself from it by relying on technique or theory as a way of feeling a little more powerful or that you're more in control. So that was very humbling. Mm -hmm. I was in a meeting with some people from, from analysts from different parts of, of the world. And several of them were saying that their patients now finally saw them as people, right? Because there was the dog. Then there was somebody was buzzing because they were, they were, they were ordering food or the, the, whatever, right? <laughs> whatever things happen when you work yeah. at, uh, at home and it had made them human and I had the thought of uh, what is it about psychoanalysis that it takes a pandemic to make us more human right <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> that classical image of like the analyst who strokes his beard and just listens without providing much interaction yeah I have a 15 month old uh, baby okay. and early on in the pandemic I'm, you know, I'm shut away in the office and I have like a noise machine so that okay. like they can't hear me, but I can hear them. Okay. And my patient would like, you know, start crying and then the baby would start crying okay. from the other room. The patient would hear the baby and start laughing. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... So many of these walls have been broken down. Yeah, that's a very good example. Something similar happened with one of my dogs. A patient was, was crying, and then one of my dogs starts kind of like whimpering because he wanted to, he's with me here in my room, but he wanted to get out. And the patient was like, what is that? Why well, have a dog? So I thought, look, I need to let him out. I hear these stories all the time now. Not just from therapists, but everyone working from home. Kids running into rooms, babies screaming, dogs. My patients know what it's like for me to get a knock at the door in the middle of the day and to look out my window to see who it is. We're holding space for so many more. The nanny in my living room, my kid, the male lady, my dog. My brother is going to law school in my basement where he lives. The electrician who is at some point supposed to show up to my house in the middle of the day. I'm thinking about all of them. Oh yeah, and my patients. I'm trying to guard them too from all of the commotion outside my guest room turned home office. It's very tiring. I'm more tired at the end of the day than I ever was before, even when I had a newborn. Here's Carlos on that exhaustion. The boundaries were very much shattered. It was difficult to sustain, and, and it made patients and therapists alike immensely tired. Uh, interesting phenomenon, probably you had it too, and, and some of your people you know your colleagues had was like early on when we started working on Zoom or on the phone, everybody reported feeling extremely tired. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like puzzled by it. You know, one thing, of course, is that we're going through a pandemic, we're full of anxieties, etc. That tires anybody. On the other hand, there was the simple fact that, you know, we have to be now focusing on a screen all day long, and they can be tiring in the eyes. But I think you know, there were different explanations. But one that, that struck me as interesting was that when we're face to face and going back to the body and embodied existence, there's so many in uh, communication that we know goes through the body so that all those things are basically absent when we're only speaking on through the screen or Zoom or on the phone. So it's kind of like the mind has to provide, kind of like look for that extra information, especially if you're a therapist or an analyst who is always trying to focus, you know, on what people are saying, how they're saying it. So it takes a lot of effort. On the other hand, in terms of loss of boundaries or the confusion of boundaries, I think it would be clearer to say was that, and, and that it would account for the tiredness is that you're seeing somebody, but you're seeing an absence, right? Mm -hmm. So the mind is struggling with having to, to integrate these two uh, mixed messages, right? The mind says they're there, but your body feels that the person is not there. So that constant tension can be very tiring as well. So that's another way of thinking about, you know, the loss of boundaries in between what's near, what's close, what's present, what's absent, what's virtual, what's real, what's private and public, professional and personal, mm -hmm. outside and inside. By its very nature, the virus is, uh, we want to use not really a Freudian terminology because it takes it from actually from shelling and, and romanticism, the, the virus is an uh, embodiment of the uncanny, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, something that makes you feel not at home at home, right? The closest you get to somebody, then the more exposed you might be. Right. So your friend might be your, your worst enemy. Where's the virus? Is it inside or is it outside? So there's kind of like this, again, lack of boundaries that leads to very uncanny experiences. Also related to time, right? The lack of differentiation between one day and another. Uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow. Felt like uh, this eternal present without differentiation that was very tiring as well. Mm -hmm. It's still going on. I think we've gotten used to it a little more, but it still happens, right? Mm -hmm. Confusion between past and present in terms of memory, too. I remember that early on in the pandemic, well, the sheltering in place, especially so like a month into it, I would wake up in the morning and in that state between being awake and asleep, I felt for a moment that I was in my childhood home. Hmm. And there was this moment of confusion for some minutes. 
I don't know if it has to do with my mind regressing to a place of safety, but I, I spoke to other uh, therapists and analysts and they've had dreams about their childhood homes, about past lives in the sense of like places they lived in the past, somehow kind of like a retreat into the past, perhaps as a way of searching some form of safety. I look back at photos of my daughter from when the pandemic started, and I can't believe how little hair she had. I can't believe that she couldn't walk. It doesn't seem real. I recently reviewed my work with a patient together, and we realized that we had only met for two months prior to our city locking down. We were in disbelief. The amount of work we accomplished in those two months made us feel like we had worked together for years. It was hard for us to believe that we had met online far longer. After Carlos and I spoke, the West Coast experienced historic wildfires. Seattle was covered in smoke for a week. My patients started feeling disoriented in regards to time and place. We couldn't see our city or where we were going. We had no bearings. The trauma response from all of us manifested as a sense of spinning out of control and out of context. A lot of regression too. I think that happens when there's lack of boundaries is a fertile soul for regression. So, you know, I see adolescents so, or young adults, they would come back home after college with their parents and they, they become adolescents again and kids again, right? Hmm. Uh, that happened. Or, or kids, right? That, uh, you know, they're seven-year-olds and then they become like three-year-olds. Uh, or adults. I had this patient that I saw that was, uh, had just broken up with a, with a boyfriend and they were feeling very lonely and they didn't know whether or not to call the boyfriend because you know, they had broken up, but, you know, they wanted some company on, on the phone at least. And then she was asking me, the patient, do you think I should call him? What do you think? I mean, but it was with this tone of almost asking for permission from me. I also understand that you want to feel someone perhaps more decisive and stronger in your mind, at least, if you're undergoing a pandemic where you feel helpless. But again, there's the element of regression, right? We had to, had to be very aware of our own counter-transference reaction to the patient's trauma because we are sharing the trauma. So we were particularly vulnerable to this because we shared it with them. Right. I am one of those analysts that work with counter-transference in order to understand the patient better and the nature of the relationship better. So I, I don't see it as a hindrance as, used to, as it used to be thought of in the past. But we have to be also mindful because we might act in ways that are might be detrimental to the to the patient, right? If we're not aware of how the shared trauma might make us act, we might uh, use therapy as our own therapy, mm -hmm. right? Unburdening ourselves from some of our own anxiety and our own pressure by becoming a little more conversational and chatty, revealing perhaps unnecessary things about ourselves or saying unnecessary things that would only burden the patient even more. I mean, we might become competitive with the patient. At least, like, who's better? Who's in the worst position, right? We might get jealous. Oh, the patient is doing better. Or you might be feel guilty. Oh, they're doing worse. That's another competitive feeling, talking about something regressive. You might become maybe a bit of a, like, an adolescent tea that way. Or simply that you might collude with the patient in dissociating certain aspects of the experience that neither you nor them want to talk about, right? Yeah. Because it can be too painful, too difficult. And also that's a form of regression. I think regression is an important in analysis and in regression is not a bad thing in itself. It's, it's, it's in, the, in the service of, let's say, change. It's in the service of, of opening up new avenues for the patient to live their life in different ways. It's a, it's a way to heal the old wounds. But sometimes regression that's not properly handled can be traumatizing and re-traumatizing. Right. And, and we're only talking about COVID, right? We're not, we haven't touched the, the racial situation 
that COVID uncovered. That's an, a, another extra layer and another virus that it adds and plays into all these anxieties, which are very, very primordial, very, very basic anxieties, right. which are the ones that, you know, that scare the living hell out of people the most. When you were talking about looking at someone on a screen and how it differs from being in the room with them, I was thinking about the levels of interpretation that take place. I'm looking at a representation of Carlos. I'm not looking at Carlos, right? Yes. You see my set, my li- the set I have here, right? Yeah, That's exactly. <laughs> right. And so there's more layers of representation to interpret, which a therapist already is doing that ideally full time. I think that that is exhausting. You're right. All the extra interpreting. But that makes me think of the immigrant experience. Is psychoanalysis and psychotherapy useful in fighting oppression? Well, I do think it is. That's, that's my, part of my, my interest as a clinician and as a, let's say, theoretician of analysis, because I like writing. But I think that there is psychoanalysis in particular, right? It has the potential to help people unburden themselves from what, you know, everybody now talks about it, uh, internalized forms of oppression. It is particularly well equipped, I think, and I can speak a little about it, mm. to, in order to understand how people internalize the very things that have made their lives miserable. It's like, why would somebody, it's not only, let's say, internalized racism, it could be internalized homophobia, internalized misogyny. The the question is, why would, let's say, a woman become uh, a misogynist when they have been the subject of misogyny, right? Why would a black person become, right, internalized or be racist against themselves in a many times an unconscious way if they have been the subject of, a, of racism. There's no common sense answer to that, right? I mostly see people of color as my patients. But when that, that aspect of oppression and internalized oppression comes up, I always tend to ask them, what would you do to yourself what people did to you and that made you feel less than human, miserable, et cetera. And then people start thinking about it. Well, psychoanalysis, I think, has ways of thinking about why that happens. And I think that once people start thinking about it and, be, and they understand the logic behind it, the, uh, the internal logic behind it, all the energy, if we want to call it psychic energy, that's being used to sustain these forms of internalized oppression can be freed up so that the person might start thinking about themselves in new and unexpected ways. Mm-hmm. And in so far as people can think of themselves in new and unexpected ways, in so far as they can author their lives or be, the, be more in charge, right? Or be more fashion, better, be more able to fashion their lives the way they want to, then I think that's in itself a political action. Mm-hmm. It is in that sense that I think that the clinic, the psychoanalytic clinic, has political potential. In the sense in which, you know, the first wave feminism thought the personal is political. I'm not saying anything new that way, right? But what analysis does is that it it works at the interface between the internal and the external. We work with how the mind becomes an internal recreation of an external situation, right? And how the external, and by the external, I mean culture, society, ideas that people have about race, about women, about gender, about sexuality, about class, etc. how these things become particularized and singularized in a specific person. That's what I think is, part, is particular of analysis. This is why everything is fair game in my sessions. My patients are always talking about their own psychological world, even when they aren't. Years ago, in community clinics, I saw a patient who had the symptom of insistence that you'll hear Carlos talk about soon in this interview. He would come every week and tell me the events of the previous week and treat me as a sounding board. 
He would even talk about his television habits. He was particularly fond of Star Trek The Next Generation. And likewise, I became very bored with him. One day he was telling me about a Star Trek episode he watched the night before. And finally I stopped him and I said, What do you find meaningful about telling me about this Star Trek episode? He started to cry and told me that he had no one to talk to, even about the mundane things in his life. The more we discussed that episode, I realized it was one with stark themes of loneliness and isolation. It made me think about the Elton John line from Rocket Man. It's lonely out in space. Understanding his mundane recapitulations as not just using me as a sounding board, but a description of his loneliness opened our work up to new possibilities. The other thing I wanted to say is that I disagree with other people or other therapists who, in some ways, many liberation psychologists who believe that therapy, in my mind, kind of like confused therapy and the therapeutic process with a form of political activism in the following sense. I don't think that, you know, we should come to therapy and tell the patient or indicate directly or indirectly to the patient, how is it that they should act politically, who they should vote for? Tell them racism is bad or white supremacy is bad or Trump is bad or this or that, or tell them, you know, your mind has been colonized by this and that. I don't think of my that as my task, although I have might have that as a theoretical framework. And the reason I don't think that we have, we should do that is because if we do that and we become kind of like the, the political activist of the patient or of the analyzer, then at some level, we are repeating the kind of infantilization that many people, especially poor people, have already gone through. It's like we're telling them we know best than you what you should do. And I'm strongly against that in general with people, and particularly with people who have been constantly told all their lives by specific people, but also by society and culture, how is it that they should act? What is it that they should think? So I don't want to have like a secret political agenda with my patients, right? Mm -hmm. I will talk about racism because I think a racism is an objective uh, reality that has to be talked about, for example. Racism, race, misogyny, relations of power, oppression, suppression. All these things are things that I've opened and that I will talk about. But we have to keep attention between using this political language, which some analysts will not even use because they think that this is outside analysis and that you're doing then some other form of whatever, therapy or, or a directive form of therapy. Mm-hmm. I disagree with that. I think we should use that language, but we have to keep it in tension with also just letting the patient come up with things by themselves and develop their own ideas and not have a hidden political agenda. Yeah. Where either we either have one side, some therapists who are race, culture, oppression, that doesn't exist. Well, it does exist, but it's not of the realm of therapy because all we're interested is in something intrapsychic, right? Some internal conflicts inside somebody's mind and the mind and the unconscious is raceless, is cultureless, is outside society and all that. So we only deal with the intrapsychic and ultimately what's universal with every human being, which is ultimately going to be some conflict around mom, dad, and siblings, Oedipus conflict, pre-Oedipus situation, etc. I think that mistaken, mm-hmm. right? But on the other hand, you have other people who feel like you've got to go and tell your patient in a more active way, kind of like become like a political activist of the patient, which I also disagree with. I think we have to keep both intentions. I've made this mistake before. With most of my clients, they come into the session and they tell me about how nervous they are about Trump. And I say, sure, me too. From there, it may build or stop. 
but I have had a few clients over the years who have expressed their support for Trump. And I've been caught in the enactment of making them feel shamed about their political choices. In certain cases, this was an enactment that was impossible to escape or work through and ultimately led to the end of treatment. I still wonder how I would have done things differently. I think I was probably disclosing how I felt about their vote even when I wasn't disclosing how I felt about their vote. But what happened when I said it was that I became something to them that I hadn't been to them before. And there was no way I was getting out of being that something. Even if I could find the pathway to curiosity about them and their political choices, which sometimes I found difficult, I became the enactment. The liberal elitist, the shaming professor, the minister telling them about their sins. We would spend the rest of treatment desperately wanting each other to be something we were not. The potential had dwindled. More from Carlos. Analysis is already, the analytic situation is already traversed by relations of power, as all human relationships are. We have to understand them. We have to uncover them. Like, for example, what you mentioned before, right? That the, in the transference, you might be seen as this being in a position of power. You might be from the, fa- the mother or the father or the doctor who knows, or you're the white person who knows, yeah. whatever it might be. And that, that position might be assumed, might, be, might have multiple incarnations. And that's something that you have to work with and deconstruct and I think challenge because it's going to tell you a lot about how the patient mind works, right? So that's one thing, right? You don't want to make the therapeutic relationship a power relationship. That's something that I, I was told early on in working with this because in, in, in doing therapeutic work because a supervisor of mine told me, if you make it a power relationship, you're always going to lose. And not only are you going to lose, the pa- everybody's going to lose, right? Like, for example, a patient telling you, a patient who was very sensitive to a comment you made, and then you feel that it, you were misinterpreted, right? Because you didn't mean it in a harsh or condemning or judgmental tone. I think it's a mistake to say, when the patient tells you, you know, I felt hurt by this or that, or even some patients, right, who might, you didn't even say anything, and they'll tell you, you know, last last session, you told you said this, this, and that, it really hurt me, and you really didn't say anything. That, that has happened to me, right? The worst thing to do is say, I, well, I didn't say that, or I didn't mean it that way. And then you get into to this power struggle, and what's the purpose of that? You're getting into the material of it and not keeping your analytic mind about what is abstractly going on i would say that abstractly more than abstractly what is what is going on at the level of the symbolical you li- lose the capacity to make meaning out of the situation and you just start acting out in, in a very concrete way where there's no capacity for thought right or for thinking or or you want to put it in beyond terms to create to connect to make links mm-hmm. that's what i think a lot of analysis is about and then what happens? Going back to the political potentiality, I think a lot of the political potentiality of, end of analysis is offering a space to think, right? And to create meaning or to deconstruct meaning, right? But when it becomes concrete in that way, in that tug of war, power struggle, as you well said, concrete situation, well, it's the death of therapy, but it's the death of the political too. Mm. If you think about it, because the political, in my mind, for definition, is the space of potentiality. It's, it's a space of thinking or acting in ways that can make the world otherwise, otherwise than what it is, right? And in there, in that, in that tug of war, it's just, we're just repeating and bumping our heads against the same, against the same, the same, the same. And I think therapy and the political, ideally, is the space of the difference of introducing difference, uh, introducing possibility. That's the realm, I think, of the political. Mm. And I think that's how analysis is the realm of political, too. It's offers a possibility. In that essay that you mentioned, I think especially working with disadvantaged people, poor people, people of color, it's offering a new possibility. And in the following sense, people who come to therapy suffer from, let's talk about, for example, a symptom, right? 
The symptom is, you know, depression. It can be anxiety. It can be, oh, I always end up in relationships with people who don't love me, right? I only end up in relationships with people who are unavailable. A symptom can be people who, no matter what happens to them, they get a raise, they get a promotion, but it's uh, everything is an occasion for criticism and negativity, right? I've had people like that, right? Mm -hmm. They they get a promotion, and I, I feel happy for them, but they feel oh, but it wasn't the promotion that I was expecting. They probably gave it to me because they feel sorry for me because I've been there five years already. There's something about the symptoms that's monotonous, that's stereotypical. The world we live in is a world where Nothing is always the same. Everything changes. It's always in constant flux. But the symptom is insistent. It's the repetition of the same. No matter what happened, it's always the same. And if we extend it, right, let's say symptoms or character traits or self ways of seeing yourself, especially, let's say, when we were going back to working with a disadvantaged people of color, right? You might see yourself in the light that's very stereotypical, right? Because let's say black people are seen in society through stereotypes, right? One of the functions of the stereotype is to eliminate the difference of the other, mm -hmm. right? It, it's like a patch over the difference. I don't want to tolerate what's different from me, so I put a patch on it so I can just see what I've projected. I just see what I want to see. It's a patch over reality. It's like, whoa, it's, it's nice. For, to the people who puts it, it looks nice. The world looks nicer that way, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way of making the place nicer for them. And nicer for them means more like them, right? We all do it up to a certain point. Because if the world is too different from us, too alien from us, it also becomes unlivable. So there's a healthy level of, uh, I would say, of projection of, of our own selves onto the world in order to make the world a little more familiar. But there's also pathologies of that, one of which is racism and stereotyping and all that. So we're going back. And then for a long time, this becomes internalized. So black people start seeing themselves, not everybody, but, uh, but many will start seeing themselves in the light of the stereotypes. You become the way you're thought of as. Mm -hmm. Hence, you know, back in the day, the movement of black is beautiful. Right, because the stereotype is it's ugly. The hair, the hair is ugly. The face is ugly. The lips are ugly. The movement is to like reinterpret yourself, rethink yourself in another light. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, it's insistent. Right. That's how the symptoms, character traits, internalized forms of of oppression. They insist, insist, insist. And then I think the therapeutic process, analytic process, just like a political, in the broadest sense of the term, is the opportunity to deconstruct that and see that, well, first, where does it come from? Why was there the need for the stereotype? Why is the need for the symptom, right? Why is the need for this character trait to begin with, mm -hmm. right? And once you analyze that and truly understand that within an emotionally charged relationship that that's meaningful to you kind of like it starts like opening it up to other forms of seeing the world of seeing yourself of seeing other people and i think that's the space of freedom what if it was different exactly what if it could change what if it were different but it takes a lot of work in my mind i thought a lot after talking to carlos about my own insistence times i broke free of it Times I didn't. I love many things about the South and many people there, but I remember feeling as I graduated undergrad that the insistence was going to swallow me whole. My dad is a furniture salesman, and his dad was too. I remember entering my first depression as I was about to graduate from college and thinking, now what? I'm supposed to move home get married, start a family, get a regular job. I love my family, but I wanted something different, so I broke out. And there are other patterns in which I still insist. 
the way I argue with my siblings, my defensiveness with my wife, looking at my phone. This work of finding the potential is never over for me. That's part of our culture nowadays of what I call self-help consumerism and the commodification of psychotherapy. You can't just throw slogans at the patient and say, you know, it's okay for you to do this. Uh, you can't be different. It's in your hands. Okay, that can work for a while. And I think that, I mean, everything that is in favor of, you know, helping people who have been oppressed, I will, I will support. But I think that ultimately it doesn't go deep enough, enough, and it doesn't do the hard work because these are deeply entrenched historical, social, and uh, psychological phenomena, like internalized oppression. Yeah. The new possibility has to be, it's a whole process, right? Because you first have to understand where all of this came from and why you are thinking of this, this symptom, this character trait as natural. This is how things are. So that's the, the space of like deconstructing, right? What is necessary, you make it by analyzing how it became what it is, you make it contingent. It didn't have to be this way because it, it became this way. It's not natural, right? It became this way. If you understand that it became a certain way and that it's not a natural kind, it's not a given, mm -hmm. then you feel that it can be another way, mm -hmm. right? But that's the whole process. That's by definition a political a political action. Black Lives Matter, people who aren't on the streets, they're trying to offer a new possibility. What if the world were this way and that way? Yeah. You know, that what if. The opposite side of that is, let's keep things the way they've always been. Exactly. Let's keep things this, the status quo. The status quo, the status quo is, is a naturalized status quo, right? And that's where the distortions begin. Right? Where there's, there's like white people who believe that they don't come from immigrants too. Yeah. Right? That, that, that's the fantasy, right? The fantasy becomes a concretized reality, mm -hmm. right? We were always here. And I think people believe that. Yeah. Truly in, the, in their hearts, some people. We were always here. Some people who have only been here for about 100 years. <laughs> white Trump supporters who believe that. They're function like they're like a symptom, mm -hmm. right? They think that they were always here. They they didn't come from anywhere, right? They're just there, always there. It's like a symptom, right? Or like a tick. What do you call that symptom? I don't know what to call it, but I I don't know. I mean, it could be. It's a form of, of racism. Yeah. It's a form of nationalism, intertwined with nationalism, with these phenomena, like the one we're describing of like, okay, we were always here. That a historical perspective is, it's not, it's not new. Uh, we could call it a form of fascism too, form of fascist kind of thinking, yeah. right? Fascism tends to be very uh, ahistorical. Or their only history is of this unpolluted past. Uh, let's say, for example, the Aryans, right? This fantasy of, of an uh, absolute origin, which is also a historical. Not only because it's not the case, but it's this idea that there is an origin. And origins, when people appeal to origins, so absolute origins, is in order to justify their position as the only one, as the one that's necessary. As opposed to, there is no origin. There is no origin. Furthermore, even if there were, we can't think of that origin. We're always in the middle of a movement, of a change, of a, of a process of development. Yeah. So I would call it maybe a form of, of, of fascism, totalitarianism, too. But the interesting is it can be political, but it's, there are totalitarian and fascist people, yeah. in the, uh, individuals, or that have totalitarian and fascist minds. Yeah independently of the political orientation. Right. right. There's something fascist and totalitarian about symptoms, I think. <laughs> I hope that everyone knows that when I speak about Southern Christian Republican culture, I'm talking about a culture that I emerged out of and still look back at with a sort of fascination. It's my culture. 
And if you know, you know that emerging out of it will provide with a lifetime of processing, especially considering that you probably still have loved ones embedded in it and shocked at your departure. My experience of race and racism in white suburbia of the South was both one of whitewashing, as in the side that says we're all Americans or race doesn't matter or we don't see color, and the side of the projections, the car rides in which parents would lock our doors as soon as we drove through a poor neighborhood, the warnings to be careful if I hung out with friends in certain neighborhoods, the ugly comments about black politicians who didn't step in line. And while I always have more to learn, thankfully, in the middle of that world, growing up in the 90s, As a teen, I became obsessed with jazz. This led me to meet musicians of color and to start playing music at black churches. This got me thinking about race and racism. Jazz, for me, was potential. Not only the musical kind, but social change and an interest in the way the world actually works. But this two-pronged racism, the whitewashing, and also the projection still thrives. I asked Carlos, how should we understand these two psychological mechanisms? Maybe, for example, like Kleinian thought could say something about it. It could be like two aspects of the same phenomenon. Klein, Melanie Klein, she introduced the idea that you might know, but you know, people who are listening to this, I'll explain it. So she introduces the idea of what she calls projective identification which she sees as a form of defense, right? The idea is that the mind uses different kinds of defenses, like projection, like negation, like repression, like compartmentalization, in order to defend itself from anxiety, right? From anxious feelings or depressive feelings. So uh, Melanie Klein introduces the idea that what she calls primitive, I like less and less to talk about primitive in psychoanalysis, let's say more primordial in the sense of development form of defense, right? What the person does is project or put into another person something that they feel uncomfortable with about themselves or something that they feel is bad in in themselves, right? And then they identify the other person with whatever they projected into that person. So that happens with racism. It happened here in the United States right? Continues to happen. But let's talk about the time in the United States with the lynching, which was practically yesterday. And people forget about that. I think people except black people forget about it. It happened yesterday. And the idea was from then, but even from before, that black men are out there to rape our black, our white women. They're hypersexual. They're out of control. Fanon says if the white women have sex with them, they'll enter into a world of ecstasy and orgies that will put in peril, right, the status quo, the manhood of the white man, etc., right? This hypersexuality and this violent sexuality is put into the black man. But it's ultimately a projection of the white man into the black man. And then the black man is identified with that. And according to that logic, it makes sense that black men who were lynched and hung, they were castrated. It's a concretization of the fantasy and of the projection. Mm -hmm. And projection of all these feelings of the white man, because everybody has sexual feelings that might be intertwine with aggressive aspects of oneself, but especially when you're a Protestant white person who has to repress and suppress these feelings, they become monsters. So then where do you put them? You have to put it in someone else, right? Mm -hmm. You project the bad into the other, right? And that happens also in the consulting room where you're seeing a patient, right? They might project something into you, right? And then identify you with that, but then they have to control you. Because you're now become the place of everything that's bad in them, mm-hmm. right? Everything that they're afraid of. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to control it when it's externalized as to when it's inside. Because inside you can't run away from it. 
So they try to control you. Let's go now to the social sphere, right? You project all this bad into the, into the black man, and then you have to control them. Right. Every way of control. All ways of control that we heard. That's projective. That's, I think that's a massive, massive projective identification. And the other side of that is that now you're only the side of the good. You're purged from all the bad. It's a purging process, right? Yeah. And now you're, you're the side of all that's good. In the Trump era, we've seen that happen more than ever. It's always been part of our society, but more than ever towards Latinx communities. You wrote something recently in which you use the example of the caravan that was yeah. traveling towards the border. The psycho- the psychological effects are already there. He has given more freedom and more power to those to where the uh, projective identification that's happening is this invasion. Yes. It's, it's, it's an invasion. There's something about projective identification is that if I'm able to put inside you Something that might feel, a, a client talks about it, right? Something that might feel persecutory, invasive, poisonous, dangerous, right? If that's something that I can put outside, right? Then it's something that can circulate. And, and it goes back to our original, the, the beginning of our conversation about the uncanny, about that loss of boundary between inside and outside. There's something about projective identification that creates this indifferentiation between what's outside and what's inside. I'm putting in you something that's ultimately mine, right? So there is uh, is a part of me that identifies something mine in you, right? But that I want to disavow. So this initiates this economy or logic, let's say, of infection, right? Or of invasion. Mm-hmm. Kind of like the, the, the movie, right? The, the Body Snatchers movie, right? Yeah. It's, it's similar to that. Who's who? Who's for real? Who's carrying what and from whom? Right? It's this confusion, right? And I think especially when you start talking about the Latinx people, when the caravan happened, 2018, right, was the one where that led to the, the State of the Union speech. All this language of, you know, again, they're rapists, they're thieves. But again, it's this idea that there are going to have in fact, he, he used this biopolitical language of infection. He talked about infection. It's going to infect the body, the political body of the nation. Let's go back to the inside outside. But the United States is already full of Latinx people. Right. Right? It's the biggest minority in the United States. And it will become a majority. Yeah. I have no doubt. So what's outside, what you identify as outside, is ultimately something that's also inside. Again, but you have to put it outside in order not to freak out about what's already a reality that's happening inside, right? Mm -hmm. I think that Trump had a a reason to to use this language and to freak out. It's already happening inside, not in the form of the fantasy of of something that, but in the form of hardworking people who are sustaining and maintaining this country and have been doing so through the pandemic, right? Right. Fascinating and terrifying at the same time to see Trump use that language of, oh, he was using infestation. He used the word infestation. Though the same language that was used by, you know, Nazi propaganda to talk about the Jewish people as rats that, you know, were, were infecting. Yeah. It's the same language and that ties in nicely to the virus, right? It's always about this virus, right? What's inside? What's outside? What's infecting? Is it, is it outside? Is it inside? Is it mine? Is it yours? This circulation that, that becomes dangerous if for people who have this fantasy of remaining pure, who think that they don't come from somewhere, that they're, they're historical, which is a fantasy, of course. Nobody's pure. Nobody's pure. Yeah, and the other with the coronavirus simply just transfers over to the Asian American community. Exactly. And suddenly they are the outsiders within. There's the outsiders within. I, uh, that's a good way of putting it. In his essay, The Political Potentiality of the Psychoanalytic Process, Carlos writes, Psychoanalysis has been, since its inception, a deviation from the norm, a discourse 
and practice on that other that is the unconscious. In its early history, psychoanalysis was referred to in Europe as the Jewish science, perhaps symbolic of the position of the Jewish people throughout history as that radical and persecuted other within, or at the core of the self-sameness of quote-unquote normal Christian Europe, or in other words, as emblematic of the unconscious. Psychoanalytic discourse and practice can thus be thought of as a scene of radical otherness within the entrails of the normal. Call this consciousness, the status quo, or ideology. In this sense, psychoanalysis, by its very nature and history, is on the side of those who have been excluded, persecuted, made invisible, and marginalized. Gloria Sandua, who's the, you know, the Chicano writer of, of Borderlands, the new, La Nueva Mestiza, the book I really recommend, she says, says something like, gringo, accept that Mexico is the doppelganger of your soul, right? Mexico has always been the outside, inside of the United States because <laughs> the United States took a great part of Mexico and made it part of its territory. So Mexico has already always been part of the United States. Great part of Mexico was taken, and then a, a lot of uh, people from Mexico they all of a sudden found themselves that they weren't in their country from one day to the other. Right. Think about that, right? Like you wake up, and then all of a sudden it's like, no, this is not Mexico anymore. This is Texas. This is Texas. So this is not something new. It's a foundational aspect of the United States. And I think many people have not wanted to acknowledge that, which, by the way, is the reality of most of most countries. There's no purity, right? There's no purity, difference, migration, movement, history. That's, that's the reality of history, right? Yeah. When it gets dangerous is when you feel that there's, you, again, this steady sense of naturalized, steady, normalized, a historical sense of self, society, community, race, etc. When you don't believe that there's no shadow. Right. Right. When you feel that there's no shadow, that's what really freaks me out with of people. <laughs> when people think they have it figured out and, and it's too clear, those people really freak me out. <laughs> I'm thinking of like a creature that doesn't have a shadow. It's like a vampire or something. It's like a vampire, right? And what are vampires? They're the, they're the living dead. And what do yeah. they do? They suck the life out of other people. They don't have a life unto themselves. Your background is in literature and philosophy. Yeah. What brought you into this work? Every therapist, everybody who's in this career, profession, you know, impossible profession, calls it Freud, right? Psychoanalysis. Everybody comes to this because we all have a wound. We're wounded some way. Hmm. It's like the mythological creature, uh, Chiron, the centaur, right? Who's the, the wounded healer. You can't heal if you're not wounded. So we all come with a wound. Part of becoming a therapist of any orientation is figuring out what's the wound and why you want it to become a therapist. I think that's an integral part of becoming a therapist and a good therapist, or a good enough therapist, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a wound that we have, some form of suffering uh, that led us to be uh, very interested in other people, to try to be maybe more empathetic or curious about people. I have that. I come from Venezuela. I've been here in the United States for 15 years, always in New York City. And in Venezuela, I, I was in an analysis. Back in the day, I, I was suffering from anxiety and panic attacks. I didn't believe much of uh, therapy. My background, I, I was a major in, originally back in the day, in philosophy, well, but also in math. I was a double major. Hmm. I was very skeptical of therapy. And then I felt it started working for me. And I was like, oh my God, this, this works. So I, I started to become interested in it. And then I ended up, because of that personal experience, becoming interested in Freud specifically and started reading. 
So I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Freud and philosophy. So I became very interested in, in psychoanalysis, reading, writing. So there was this theoretical interest that sprang from my own experience in therapy. So I came to the United States to continue studying in a program at the New School that has a program in philosophy with a concentration in psychoanalysis. Becoming an immigrant, I started again suffering from anxiety, you know, adapting, mm. kind of like feeling like you're living in limbo, like from neither from here nor from there. I would be walking New York City and then I was standing up, oh my God, I live here now. It felt, it felt like unreal, like I was in a movie or I was on vacation. <laughs> it was very weird. It's a whole, you know, process that I went through. So I really needed therapy. And I started to think, look, I, unless I, I train in some way, I won't be able to really understand what I'm writing or thinking about. So there was a two-year specialization program at the institute where I trained, which is ITAR, Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research here in New York City. It was a two-year program, and I said, well, let me, let me, you know, for people, again, for people who didn't come from the mental health field, right, which are traditionally social work, psychology, psychiatry, mental health counseling. So I did two years, saw a couple of patients, and I was like, this is what I want. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, this really integrates. This is like the real integration of the different things that I've been doing all along since I started in math, which was always my interest in, in language, I think, somehow. It was concrete. It was real. It was with another person, a real person. I was, I'd, I'd also become very disappointed with academia because it, it seemed too lofty or too, you know, people enclosed within their bubbles of truth and think they have think everything figured out. The pressures to publish here and there, to write a certain style. I got a little tired of that. I hate the lingo. I sometimes you need to use it, but you need to use, you know, plain words. Uh, Wittgenstein says if you can say something, then you can say something clearly, right? I, 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 do, I do believe that as much as possible. Sometimes it's, it's not possible, but as much as you can. It was a experience, a revelation for me of what I liked, but also the power of sitting with another person who's talking to you in the conditions of intimacy and trust. I saw that there was something transformative for both the person and for me. Because that's something that therapists often don't talk about, how transformative being a therapist is. Sometimes I feel guilty because I feel that I'm benefiting from more than the patient from the process. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, this is, you learn a lot about yourself. But then I, I applied for psychoanalytic training. They took me in. And it was interesting because back when I started, it was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, there weren't a lot of people who didn't come from the mental health field. So I, I studied with a lot of social workers and psychologists, and I, I was coming from philosophy. And still, I don't think there's many people who, who have a background in philosophy in the United States, because yeah. it's, a, it's a more medicalized model that, of psychoanalysis, unlike Europe or South America. And also, I was one of the few persons of color in the, the Institute, too. I was uh, kind of like the, the stranger, both in terms of where I came from professionally and, and the country I came from. But I found that, again, there's a thing of, of course, of wanting to help people, of course, in a very concrete way. But I think I was interested in, in the process, the very particular process that two people can go through. That if we save that space, we've done something important. If two people can talk to each other the way people talk to each other in therapy or in analysis, there's hope. Carlos, thank you so much. No, thank you for inviting me. I had a good time. Our sincere thanks to Carlos Padron for joining us on the show. His essay, The Political Potentiality of the Psychoanalytic Process, can be found in Psychoanalysis in the Barrios. And follow him on Instagram at Carlos Padron underscore psychoanalysis. This has been Between Us, which is produced by myself, John Totten, and Mason Neely, who also composes our music. Find us on social media. We have a Facebook, an Instagram, a Twitter, 
we've started posting videos to YouTube. Most importantly, find us where you find podcasts and subscribe. And until next time, take care.